Hi, good afternoon and welcome to a very, very special session live on Astro Awani at uh, Channel 501 on Astro in Malaysia. And you can also watch us live on astroawani.com or you can download our app on your mobile gadget. But um, I'm thankful to the World Economic Forum for the first time, Astro Awani, the first 24 hours news and current affairs channel in Malaysia, has this ability to not only develop and partner a discussion, but also show it to all the audience available. So I would like to thank all of you in the hall today. I promise you, you will never regret spending one hour here because I've had a pre-talk with all five of my panelists and they are all rebels actually, despite their official designations. Um, so my job is easy and I'll introduce them to you. In Asia, we have to start from the right. Thank and you. I only have one rose among the thorns. So I'm, I'm gonna start with Professor Eniko the Vice President, Office of Business Development, Academic Director, Business Family Institute, Professor of Finance and in, at the Singapore Management University. But uh, in short, she's the iconic lady who's going to empower the small and medium enterprises, family-owned or otherwise, in ASEAN. Thank you so much, Professor, for making time. Thank you. And a Malaysian that I myself cannot cash in. So I told him that after this, I'm going to sit there at the airport every time so that I can stop him there. Datuk Sri Vijay Eswaran, um, a maverick of many things. He can talk about spirituality. He has built a conglomerate of companies so successful across the world. And what more can I say? He speaks better than I do, and it's my job to speak. Datuk Sri Vijay Swaran, thank you so much for making time. And when I said that, uh, I told my friends that I'm going to have a live show at the WEF, and one of my panelists was, uh, is going to be from Amnesty International. They said that, good luck to you, and I, they will not see me anymore <laughs> after this <laughs> show. But I know Salih Shetty understand the dynamic of each country he goes to, and we will have this discourse for the sake of the region and the world, and it's in the interest of people everywhere, from the grassroots, from the highlands of the huts of Borneo, right down to the plains of Laos. Uh, and uh, I would like to welcome you, Mr. Secretary General of Amnesty International. This is the first time ever on Astro Awani, and I'm very, very honored. Thank you for making time. And of course, if you see that the design of sitting itself shows and communicate things, all the three Mavericks are here. Those who have to defend their governments are on my left. And Datuk Paul Lo is the minister in the Prime Minister's department. And he looks at governance, integrity, and also human rights. But if you only see that line and layer of Datuk Paul Lo, you, you're going to be wrong. Because he has been for the longest time and sort of entrepreneurial in building corporate entities and he was in the FMM for a long time. He also engages with the NGOs all the time. He's in politics, but he's not a politician. That's what he reminds me from time to time. Last but not least, Lao. I thank God to Tan Sri uh, Tony Fernandez because now I can fly to your country after meeting you. <laughs> Before this, I didn't want to go because I had no contacts, but now I do have one. And um, the Foreign Minister of Lao, you, you're going to thank me for this, Mr. Sulam Se Komasit. Do, did I pronounce that right? Yes. yes. Language yes. is the first barrier, but we're going to overcome that because ASEAN has agreed on English as the main uh, language. But um, I'm going to start with this. Unity in diversity. There's a lot of talk about this. What, what that means for me is what that means for this small kid who barely understands the world yet at five and six years old, wearing rubber slippers, walking across a dirt track and ending up in another country. But it doesn't matter to that kid because they share the same food almost, they could understand one another, they look almost alike, and they even have the same religion. I'll continue the story of that kid later, mm -hmm. but what I want to put first for all my panelists to answer in the first round is, mm. definitely we need unity in diversity, but the challenge is, how do you see that happening from each of your own respective areas, industries? Mm. So, because I said industry first, so I'm going to go here, so the only flower. Mm. If we talk about unity in diversity, mm. there's social, cultural, and also economic imperative to that. Mm. And you talk about SME, it's mm. very competitive out there. Mm. So, 
how would you have unity in diversity if I take from what you are researching and what you are propagating? Mm, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I am actually going to do it slightly in reverse. I think social and cultural actually should be the glue okay. rather than just the economics. Mm -hmm. And I'm wearing the hat as chairperson of the Global Agenda Council. And my co-chair is right there, Dr. Rebecca. Can you please stand up, Rebecca, please? One of Malaysia's very own talented lady. Yeah. And the two of us actually for the last two years in uh, coming together for our Global Agenda Council to look at Southeast Asia, we've actually identified that all the efforts in driving change in ASEAN, in bringing ASEAN countries together, must start at the level of having an ASEAN identity. We must have a common set of shared values. And all of us actually are very linked, much closer than we realise. My grandparents are from Fujian, China. But when they migrated, they landed not in Singapore. They landed in Batu Pahat and Malacca. My father's from Malacca, my mom's from Batu Pahat. And then the third generation, which is my generation, <coughs> we moved to Singapore. Last week, I attended a wedding in Jakarta. My niece is married in Jakarta and my brother-in-law is Indonesian. So already at the family level, all of us have connections to all parts of ASEAN. So if you ask me, it's actually not difficult for small medium enterprises looking to grow global to identify shared <coughs> values in economics, in fundamentals of hard working, integrity, doing the right thing with their counterparts. So some of my best business cases are actually written on small medium enterprises, family owned, that is actually growing global with partners. Mm. So we will talk about the identity the next round when I actually uh, commission a little survey amongst the global shapers of the forum. So thank you to the WEF Forum because they've actually given me the future the whole theme is about powering ASEAN's future. And we will hear from the voices of the future, the so next round. who owns uh, Cha Kui Tiao and uh, P. Ramli movies? Uh, I'll yeah, ask you later. I know, I'll I ask know, you later. I know you're going to come <laughs> there. But if you look at the word cloud from the Global Shapers, okay. it's actually about culture and diversity. Right. And they did not argue about food. Okay. Isn't that amazing? We'll go to food later because yes. they've just had lunch. So I'm lucky. <laughs> Dato Sri Vijay is Warren. You have always been more than what you are in terms of thought, even from before you've been in the company. Because when I read about your profile background and the interviews, tons of interviews you give on YouTube that we can search and find, it's always been about the key elements of an individual instead of looking at it from the top down, nation states, conglomerates or anything else. So I think that was how you built your group, so if you can share that moment, because if we were to go for unity in diversity, we've got to transcend all gaps and differences. I, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. I totally agree. Uh, you know, if at all, if uh, this ASEAN identity, our entity is going to be actually become reality, mm -hmm. we are going to have to start with recognizing that we are ASEAN. And um, the, the one thing that uh, struck me, because in comparison, we always look at ASEAN and EU, for instance. EU is uh, beginning to come together. It's melding, so to speak. Uh, in Davos earlier on this year, and um, I, I had the occasion to basically address the Malaysian Swiss Chamber of Commerce. And uh, among the questions that they were asking was, um, we have so many Swiss companies, you know, in Malaysia, uh, do you have any Malaysian companies investing in Switzerland? Now, that's a common question. Yes. But they added, and this addendum is important, if not Switzerland, are you at least investing in Europe? Now, the question here that struck me is, would we think that in ASEAN? Would, a, would, a, would an investment in Laos or investment you know, in Indonesia make a difference to us in Malaysia? Would we even think that we are in all part of the same ecosystem in a sense? Mm -hmm. We haven't yet you know, developed that sense of identity. Uh, as a company, you know, we have always begun without caste, color, race, any kind of uh, boundary, so to speak. We have looked upon as, uh, as a global village. 
and we have always you know, taken this upon ourselves to build ourselves across all regions. But in ASEAN, we are truly ASEAN. You know, we have our copywriting and our uh, 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 customer support systems built out of Manila. We have our product development systems out of uh, Bangkok. We have graphic design and so on coming out of Jakarta. We have our backroom operations from here. We have our legal systems running from Singapore. So, and all of us work together because we are in virtual reality. Mm -hmm. We're able to do that today in today's industry. There is a whole new wave that's happening right now. And we either need to join the millennials or the millennials are going to leave us standing behind. Okay. So that's one question we have to deal with. What is, you know, in terms of ASEAN and the jobs, is that is there going to be something that we are going to be looking at towards, you know, ASEAN coming together, bringing our boundaries down and actually making it work. So in short, you're saying that ASEAN was put together four decades ago by the grandfathers now their grandchildren has got to determine what ASEAN will be. But what ASEAN will be, I know Sanil will say that we have to have adherence to human rights. So I'll give you the chance now to give your views. Thank you, Comrade. I think that, uh, you know, I, I, when I was thinking about the subject as to how to even have this conversation, my mind went to when we are born, when we go into, you know, a kindergarten, nursery school, and you're going to primary school, at that stage, you know, we, we don't differentiate between boys, girls, uh, color, race, caste, Malay, Chinese, Indian. So it's not natural for human beings to differentiate between each other. But very quickly, we start creating these identities. Because when you're born, you're, you're comfortable with having multiple identities. You could be a you know, woman and a human being, or you could be a Muslim and a human being. But very quickly, you know, we are being told that we are this and that, and then from there on, you know, the corruption of the mind begins. So I would say that, you know, we can talk about human rights in a general sense, but the foundational values of fairness, justice, equality, respect for the other is something which will happen. It comes from parents, it comes from our education system. And so building rights respecting societies is the challenge. And for ASEAN, you know, just like in India, which is where I come from, these okay. are melting pots. You know? I mm -hmm. mean, you just, because you have India on one side, China on the other, mm -hmm. and this is the land mass in between. So you have a very rich variety of people, cultures, languages, religions. We just have to come to terms with that. You know, we have to, it doesn't matter if you're a Rohingya. You know, you've come from one side of the border to this side. You can't be treated the way you're being treated today. And so, and who is, whose job is it to protect the rights of people when, mm -hmm. you know, when, uh, a religion which is based on peace, like Buddhism, starts attacking Rohingyas based okay. on their origin. Mm -hmm. Who's going to take action, you know? So, and what happens when the country is not taking action? That's why we have ASEAN. But ASEAN mechanisms are so weak because everything has to be decided by consensus. And everyone's got skeletons in the cupboard, right? Every one of these governments have skeletons in the cupboard. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to. Consensus means you, look, you do what you do, I do what I do, we'll all look the other way. So it's clear what brought ASEAN to where it is. It's not the finished product. It's, it, it is work in progress. So is that easy for us to talk about it? You guys have to see it in the countless meetings. Professor Kishore Mabu Bani put it as one of ASEAN's strengths because ASEAN have more than 1,000 meetings a year. So I'm going to put it to a minister from Laos now. How do you look at it? Because even in ASEAN, it's always been looked upon as the first five or the top six and the rest of the four. So how do you look at that as an ASEAN unity in diversity propelling us forward? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, these questions. And it is very, very interesting questions. I think uh, if we look back probably three decades ago, nobody is going to imagine that ASEAN would be today. Uh, let alone the political system among ASEAN countries. We have a different political uh, system. We have diverse cultural background, ranging from uh, Muslim to Christian, which this is something that unique that ASEAN has. I don't think that other, other part of the world would have the same, the same diversity. Today and next year, ASEAN would, would celebrate the golden jubilee of, yep. of ASEAN. Yep. And then 
uh, uh, we can look back uh, five decades ago how ASEAN has been progressing day to day. And that can tell us how we uh, enhance unity uh, among ASEAN countries which have a different uh, background. Consensus is, is the one that governs all ASEAN countries together uh, today. I think this is the principle, and I uh, fully agree with you that this is ASEAN in uh, process. Okay. We, are, we are not yet. We have been talking what is really ASEAN identity. Mm. It is still a uh, 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 contested uh, okay. idea. We, we don't know. Uh, somebody would say that ASEAN might resemble a European Union, mm -hmm. but in fact, that, that, is not, that, that is not the case. Yes. ASEAN would have its own way. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, every year ASEAN have so many meetings. Uh, leaders uh, get together, discuss things, uh, in order for us to, to get a consensus on what we are going. Mm -hmm. I think we have the uh, vision, uh, ASEAN Community Vision 2025, Five, yes. which is uh, a blueprint for, for all ASEAN countries to, to implement, and I, and I hope that uh, uh, we will get there. Sooner or later, we we'll get there. But we do our, on our uh, ASEAN way. Dr. Paul, we do not shun from the tasks and responsibilities of talking about a better society through better governance. I know for a fact, because I've been with you just recently, we were at the Institute of Integrity Malaysia, looking at the enforcement of integrity, not only through laws, but as a value and a culture uh, instilled. So how would you like to take the point that uh, Sanjan has raised? Because for the longest time, ASEAN relied on ZOP Fund, Zone of Peace, Freedom and Neutrality. That means we keep our region safe, but we don't interfere. Like if it's a neighborhood, I don't get involved in domestic squabbles of the neighbor's house. But now, those issues transcend national borders. Society hope for them to be picked up and addressed, at least, if not solved immediately. So how would you talk about what's happening in Malaysia and at the region? Okay, if I can change the perspective a little, uh, because uh, I'm a minister and I engage extensively with NGOs and the people mm. at the grassroots. So for ASEAN, uh, whatever plan, vision you have, a nice sounding name, the only citizens is going to say, I will only have belief in the vision and values when it gives me a good future. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's important, mm -hmm. you know? And it gives hope for myself and for my children. Uh, if ASEAN cannot deliver those, then we have to relook at it, whatever that we do. Okay. And I would say the area of, uh, of, of, of uh, shared values and rights uh, doesn't just recover social liberties or social civil rights alone. Uh, basically, ASEAN is a very diverse economy. You have both the richer country, you have both the poorer countries, and their needs are all different. Mm. But I, I would say at the end, as a citizen in ASEAN, uh, I want to see peace and political stability. That's important. In fact, ASEAN was formed basically out of a political and security necessity, okay. not an economic one. Yes. Mm. Then once you have that, I want to see economic opportunity. Mm. I want to see employment. No point talking about everything when I don't have food on the table, when I don't have jobs, and when I don't have opportunities. You know? mm. So the economic development and how is ASEAN is going to share their economic fruits. That's, that's important. And of course, finally, I know uh, Shetty, uh, that is probably your part of the area. At the end, these things are still not enough mm -hmm. because we want civil liberty. We want inclusiveness. We want dialogue, you know? So that's where I think the difficult part for ASEAN, I think that part is going to be challenged. Okay. The other part, probably is okay, sure. but the civil liberty part, mm -hmm. the social activist, uh, that part, and how much freedom, mm -hmm. I think is going to be a challenge. Okay, mm -hmm. um, we have finished the first round. Mm -hmm. 
supposed to take key highlights, but I want to increase the temperature. Mm. While we're settling in and trying to be cosy about defining what's the identity, how we get there, mm. then this is thing that Professor Klaus Schwab threw at the Davos summit this mm. year, the fourth industrial revolution. Mm. Surprise, surprise. If I go back to my hometown and ask my pedophile cousins about this, they're <laughs> going to laugh at me, say I've been corrupted by the Klang Valley culture. But that's the fact. Mm. Uh, Datuk Sri Mustafa Muhammad, I'm, I'm glad the right hand lady is there. <laughs> I will go to you later. Um, he said that there's, you know, people have raised the point that there's, that's the Malaysia of KL and that's, that's the Malaysia of Jali, where he comes from in Kelantan, a state in Malaysia. So, inclusivity, I think, is key, no matter what the disruptors and disruption is. Mm. So I'm going to go to you. This is the last time I'm going to give Singapore first because mm. we're tired of getting Singapore first every time. <laughs> so, Prof. Annie, how do you look at that? Because if we were to share, mm. yeah. if we were to include, then Singapore of all being the most developed of mm. the 10 ASEAN countries would say, mm. I am the one who has to share a lot because I'm in front. Mm. So how do you look at that as a responsibility or is that a burden? How do you see it? So, you know, it's amazing because when uh, Minister Datuk Lo said the rich and the poor, the rich, he looked at me. <laughs> and now Bahrain also looked at me. But actually, it's amazing. Amongst the 10 countries, Singapore is the tiniest. And we are actually aging very fast. By 2030, we will have 900,000 Singaporeans above 65. So just from pure demographics alone, we really need ASEAN to be with us. <laughs> And we need lots of friends. And it's, it's like, you know, we are actually looking forward to being an ASEAN partner. And, you know, Shetty actually hit it on the nail. You have India, you have China, and in the middle, you have ASEAN. What makes ASEAN unique is the dish called roja. Okay. Yes. Cut and fruits with chili yes. paste. Okay. Roja yes. is important. And roja, every little ingredient in roja makes a difference. So you actually have, you know, you have to have your tibun, you have to have your pangkuan, you have to have your, your yucha kueh, all of that. And then the glue, the heko, the sauce that glue everybody together. And if there's one missing ingredient, roja cannot be roja. Yes. So ASEAN to me is roja. Every ingredient counts. And if you would permit me, sure. all right, Mr. Moderator, yeah. I actually brought a show and tell. The power of ASEAN in the future must come from the voices of the future. Not that we are not young, but we are young at heart on this panel. I really would like to call one of my global shapers. May I? Yes. Hong Jun, are you ready? Can I have a mic for this young man here? And where are the rest of the global shapers? Do I have the rest of the global shapers here? Can we, can we have the Global Shapers kind of stand yes. up? Oh, stand wow, up. We they are right. Give you a clap. Come on. Can we give them a clap? <laughs> These are the Global Shapers that come from the countries in ASEAN. We cannot build a work in progress if our legacy do not believe in what we have built. Mm -hmm. So, Hong Jun, all yours. Okay, and the rest of you can sit down. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hong Jun. I'm a Global Shaper with the Singapore Hub. And together with a group of shapers from the ASEAN region, we have, started to, we have started the process of trying to understand and possibly define what exactly the ASEAN identity is. So we started a project called We Are ASEAN, which to use a term that I think one of the panelists mentioned earlier. And we did a very simple survey to get a sense of what young people in ASEAN actually thought about the region. So we found that 76% of the young people in ASEAN actually identified with being part of the region. And more than 95% indicated that, yes, they are very interested in learning about the different cultures across the different countries. And similarly, more than 95% said it's very important for us to cultivate stronger relationships between the people in ASEAN. But when we got to the question of what exactly does ASEAN identity mean to you, and if you were to suggest three words that come to mind. There were a lot of words that were generated. Food was definitely one of them. Football? No. Food. Food. Okay. No, yeah. not football. Not football. For sure. Okay. So, food was one of them, but the two most um, mentioned words were actually multicultural and diversity. While on the surface it looks like a, a fairly accurate representation of what it means to be ASEAN, if you look at these two words, you wouldn't find it odd 
to use the same two words to describe any city, region, country that has a multitude of cultures and religions living and working in sure. the same place. So to us, what we see is an exciting opportunity for the millennials in cool. ASEAN to not yeah. just shape the future of Thank the region. Thank you for making us feel old here. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but to also play, and ver play a very active role okay. in defining what exactly does it mean for us to be part of the... You know, this show is live on TV, mm -hmm. so you might want to introduce yourself again so that <laughs> my team there can put your name on air. Sure. <laughs> and, um, you know, pretty young people from across 10 countries can send you emails. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yep. The power of yes. connectivity. Yeah. Yep. Your so, name again? Uh, Hong Jin, H-O-N-G-G-N. Hong Jin, yeah? Yes. Oh, Hong Jin, the house rule, when I, whenever I moderate, if, if you give out your ideas, you must be able to answer a question for them. Mm. So I'm, I'm going to ask you this. So is the ideal picture for millennials is that if you come from any of the 10 ASEAN countries, mm. if I ask you, oh, what's your name? And then naturally the next one, where do you come from? The answer will be, I'm an ASEAN citizen, but I'm from Thailand or I'm from Malaysia. Is that the ideal scenario? The exact nuancing in my version is slightly different. Okay. So when I first took on this project or decided to start this project, I went through the process of trying to decide what exactly is that big fuzzy goal that we're trying okay. to achieve. Cool. I think the national identity is strong and people are naturally rooted to their country of origin and the okay. heritage that goes into that. Yes. So to me, I'll be very satisfied if people can say, yeah, my name is Hong Jin, I'm from Singapore, but we are part of ASEAN and do you know certain facts and certain uh, interesting things about ASEAN? Okay. So to me, that would be a a win in that sense. So who owns Chia Kui Tiao? Malaysia or Singapore? <laughs> who has the best hockey How about no, I'm just you kidding. come to Singapore, I bring letter. you to eat Chia Kui Tiao. Don't oh. be so defensive. Singaporeans, <laughs> so defensive. Never mind. Uh, thank you so thank much. You I'll come to your other friends later. Um, I don't want to go so routine clockwise. Yes, but I'm going to go to you again for the last time. Datuk Sri, um, you heard the voice of the young. But we inherited what we have now. 550 years of the colonial period, you know. I was always wondering why the people in southern Thailand look more and sound more like me rather than the rest of Thailand. Then when you look at history, you understand. But um, can we really surpass all these things? Because relatively, we are all young nations. EU achieved that after many hundreds of years. America is where they are because they had that time. I want to give the factor of time now for you to factor in while the fourth industrial revolution says that disruption is going to happen everywhere, we still need the sustainability of planning things long term and keeping to that path. Historically, ASEAN, you know, 500 years ago was probably a lot closer together than it is today. A lot of that has to be blamed on to, I mean, arguably on to the EU. Okay. Because if you take a look at Indonesia right now, they, they choose a, a place where they want to continue their tertiary education, they would tend to look towards Holland. Yeah. We in Singapore would look towards London, okay. you know, and uh, Manila would look towards the US and, and so on. Uh, and the best French coffee comes from Laos and Vietnam, you know. And the best croissants in the world supposedly come from Hanoi today. Okay. So we have France, we have Holland, we have the UK, and then we have um, the, Americans. You know, the Americans and, and the Spaniards in between because, you know, it was mm. a Spanish colony. So all of this have also blended into this rojak that we have right now. Yeah. But they've also created divisions in the, tens, in the sense that we have a Dutch legal system in Indonesia. Okay. You know, we have a French-based legal system in, in running out of Vietnam and, and Laos and so on, into China, for instance. And uh, we, we have our British legal systems over here. All of this neat transition. EU took a while to get together. Okay. So will we. But um, having said that, you know, we have to overcome these differences because for a thousand years before that, you know, we were, you know, essentially one land. Okay. You know, I mean, Angkor Wat was basically the largest Hindu yeah. complex of its kind, but Borobudur on its side. So when we had empires, it encompasses the whole of Southeast Asia. The whole area. There were, the divisions we have today yeah. are very different. But unfortunately, the, the thinking needs to change. Mm -hmm. I mean, the average Singaporean doesn't get up, you know, thinking, I'm going to go spend my holiday in Boracay or Bali or, mm -hmm. you know, he I thinks think. London. 
<laughs> you know, he, he thinks London or Rome or wherever. I mean, likewise, you know, uh, the Malaysians for that matter. We don't think of Laos, you know, we don't think of the beauty of Vientiane. We don't think of the beauty of uh, Myanmar, Bagan, you know, places like this. I mean, the connectivity between ASEAN has to improve drastically to begin with. Communication is the other factor. Okay. Lingua franca is supposedly English. We are able cool. to communicate right now because of English. So technology is on our side. It now is. you can Skype with anyone across ASEAN countries. That free makes, almost. That makes a tremendous difference. Yeah. In terms of even business. I mean, with due regard to uh, Dr. Lo, uh, uh, and he's right in the sense that, you know, our forefathers started ASEAN primarily because of security concerns. And there were, there were the concerns, real concerns at that point. But today it is economic considerations that we need to take mm. into account. Mm. We do have India and we do have China. Mm. We also have 10,000 kilometers away, the US pulling at us. You know, right now TPPA is another point of contention. I mean, people want ASEAN anyway. If we don't realize what ASEAN is, if we don't come together and make ASEAN work, then we will be pulled at all around the edges, because everyone else wants a piece of ASEAN. Okay. If I take government to government versus people to people, there's a huge gap there for ASEAN. For the longest time, it's been the government to government conversation. But now the conversation through technology doesn't have to come from the top. It happens anyway. Because exactly. they, they went to Bali and they're not satisfied with the normal stuff. They want to go inside and beyond, not just Kuta and whatever else, for example. So my point to Salil here is, yes, we can look at it as the government need to do something about human rights. But the government here in Southeast Asia is elected by the people and the needs and wants of the people are changing and changing rapidly. And they will want to vote in the government that listen and adheres and stick to all these principles that we're talking about. Isn't that the more sustainable way of ensuring human rights? I think there's, yeah, for sure. But, you know, we have, uh, it's, if you take each country in this region, um, you may have elections but don't equate elections with accountability. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you, you may have a government which is elected, but it's not necessarily legitimate in the eyes of the people. So if you want to earn the respect and trust of the people, these days you need a bit more than saying you got voted into power. Because first of all, you know, we, I also come from a country which is always claiming that it's the greatest democracy. Okay. But in the end, okay, Large. you may get voted. <laughs> Uh, but you know that the, the trust between uh, ordinary citizens and the government has never been so low as it is today. So, and that takes us to what Minister Lowe said. You know, and one of the challenges we have in the ASEAN region is somehow from the beginning there's a separation in the understanding and the conceptual understanding that on the one side you have civil political freedoms, on the other side you have stability and economic growth. That somehow these two things are almost antithetical to each other. Mm -hmm. And that's, in my view, fundamentally flawed, certainly in this day and age, because okay. the people who are younger people you talked about, it's mm -hmm. not them looking at the future, because they're looking at the present. I mean, we have in Malaysia, one of the minister knows very well, in the last one year, in 2015, Amnesty International recorded the Sedition Act has been used 91 times. Uh, cartoonist Zunar has been charged with sedition 11 times. Each time he tweets. So, you know, you can't separate out economic development from fundamental freedoms. That's okay. not the way people think about things anymore. Material okay. success is important, mm -hmm. but respect. So what is diversity? Diversity mm -hmm. means that you're not, you can't discriminate. Okay. It's non-discrimination. Cool. So um, what I'm trying to say is that we cannot have a conversation about economics and politics okay. separate from culture and social diversity. Okay, I get it. I'm going to give it to Dr. Paul now because even since the 90s when I started being a journalist, we have always been debating this. How do you ensure that we don't destroy or regress on the prosperity, wealth creation, advancement, social cohesion that we have, but at the same time improving this other side, transparency, respect. I, for one, would want freedom of information, but I don't want it to come at the cost of others. So how would we balance this? And it's easy to sit there from the West and say that we don't have political freedom, press freedom, or whatever. But for us living here, we've got to make do with what we have. And if it's still work in progress, Dr. Paul, can you please add context to what Salian has said? All right. I, I, I think uh, if you are talking about civil liberty, civil rights, human rights, 
it also have to relate to the cultural attributes that are existing in the society. And secondly, it also have uh, to relate uh, to uh, the conditions in each, uh, in, in each society. And I know, we, we, I've discussed with MST frequently and other NGOs. Um, and also, also he has to deal with the democratic and political maturity of each, yes. each, each society. So first thing is, I know many civil so uh, society organizations says we must have freedom in this, we must have consultation mm -hmm. in this, uh, we should be able to do this, to do that. But we have to bear in mind is that at the end, for the government, we want to see a progressive state that is stable and peace and in harmony. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have that, then you, you can't talk of anything else, mm -hmm. not even, not even your, 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 your future. Uh, so it's a balance that every government has to, to deal with. And when you talk about freedom and liberality, uh, it always comes with a boundary. Okay. Uh, you have to define it. Because individual liberty, yes, you may have all you want, but collectively, the society may not want everything that you want. You know, so each of us has to operate within the boundary that is defined. But I think the challenge is how do you define the boundary? This is where I think the inclusiveness and engagement that is, uh, that is necessary. Yeah. If you talk to one another, then you won't fight so much. That's the premise. So. I'm going to go back to Singapore before I go to Laos. <laughs> Singapore okay. jealously got what it has achieved since no, 1965, in a sense. Mm. But of course, time is changing. Mm. And I was there at your general election, so I can see. <laughs> um, but how do you see that statement over there? Because for many countries around the world, even developed ones, mm. it's not enough just to give material advancements anymore. Yeah. People want self actualization. Mm -hmm. Even if you use the often used Abraham, Mas Abraham Maslow's the hierarchy of needs, mm. self actualization must be there. Yeah. And so I think we have this great opportunity today. The fourth industrial revolution doesn't mean that we need to go through first, second, third. In fact, the best examples of people leapfrogging are actually from the young members of ASEAN. If you look at Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, <laughs> no, they, they actually said, why do we need to follow the path of Singapore or Malaysia? <laughs> right? Okay. Why must we go through step one, step two, step three? Technology has allowed us to leapfrog jumpstart. Okay. And we now become the learning models. So in fact, Singapore has rightly learned from many partners. And we are actually saying, we need not be an EU. We should create our own version of un unity in diversity. So that's why I'm very interested to ask the global shapers. Mm. How do they see the role of government in all these things that we are talking right now? Because they might have a different expectation of government nowadays and for the future. And that is very important for ASEAN because we do not have a supranational body like the EU in Brussels and all that. Mm. All the things that we agreed upon will have to go back to each respective government and their empowered institutions to carry it out. So can any Anyone? global shaper take that up? What do you expect from the government of yours plus the other nine in ASEAN to make this a reality? Because sometimes the Gen Y, they don't want to talk about it. They just want to do it. <laughs> If not, Hong Jin, yes. you will represent them. You're not in yeah, Singapore, it's okay. You're in Malaysia. I want another young <laughs> voice. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Please introduce yourself. And then Hi, I'm Angel Bombarda from the Manila Hub. Okay. Interestingly, I work for the Philippine government, but I'm transitioning out because we have a new administration. But I guess um, what young people would like from government in the ASEAN is for our governments to, to take a stronger stand in ASEAN issues and not, you know, walk on eggshells around each other. And because we tend to be like so nice to each other during these council meetings and we talk and we talk, but we don't really see that much happening when, you know, these leaders go back to the home countries and we don't see um, projects or programs proposed being implemented, for example, like we haven't I, um, we haven't seen our governments really focus on labor migration, which, you know, this is a big issue for us young people because mm. this poses, you know, both a challenge and an opportunity. So really for government to take a stronger stand 
and for our governments to prioritize ASEAN and prioritize our membership to this, you know, region because every, you know, every other part of the world is looking at us. Thank Does you, that include Angel. the South China Sea? That's a very controversial issue as well, and we must. Is it yeah. for young people also? Um, I thought well, you guys just assumed that the sea must be protected for you to enjoy forever. It's important for it's important for the Philippines, and I think that it's important for countries to not um, be afraid. For countries like now, the I see the civil servant in you. To not be afraid okay. of you know the bigger. N never mind. There's only one person here who sits in the inter you know foreign ministerial meeting, so I have to go to you, Minister. For that, for that question at that point that she raised. They want to see ASEAN countries doing more. Aren't you guys doing more? Well, I, 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 must, to, I must confess that uh, uh, the number of meetings that ASEAN leaders having every year doesn't much con contribute to the broader public awareness about ASEAN. The other day, I attended the Asia Pacific Roundtable, which is, was also on ASEAN. We were discussing, uh, we were asking who represents among the participants, who represents the parliament from ASEAN countries. Apparently, there were none. So the question is how we can raise public awareness among not only general public, but also among government officials. This is something that ASEAN has to, to do more. By relevance? By relevance. If I give you the Mekong River, and I'm very much in tune with sustainability discussion. Mm. I just came back from London for the Malaysian GZAC uh, to talk mm. about that. Water is very precious. Some say that the next world war, if it ever happens, is going to come of a dispute of clean water to drink. <coughs> so the Mekong River gives life and sustenance Correct. to not just the flora and fauna, but to the people of many countries in ASEAN. And you have to talk to the superpower that <laughs> people call China anyway. So if you walk the talk, that Mekong River jurisdiction and issues will have to be solved for the young people to enjoy the benefit of the Mekong River? Well, Mekong River is, is the, what we call a, a, a shared river among the countries uh, which are riparian to the Mekong River. But of course, the Mekong River is uh, originated from, from the country in the north. Um, for the Mekong River, there is International uh, River, Mekong River Commission, MRC, which takes care of of the sustainability use, sustainable, uh, sustainable development of uh, Mekong River. And uh, uh, I do agree that uh, if we don't uh, sustainably use or manage Mekong River and the river, and not only Mekong River, but all tributary of the Mekong River, okay. we, would be, uh, we would be facing uh, a challenge I mean, just recent drought. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks God that just recently, last week, um, uh, the rain started across the riparian uh, countries of the Mekong River. So it's not the right of the neighbor on top of you or the north of you to build a dam. They must ask you first. Because if, if it affects the water flow, you want to have a say, right? Well, um, of course, uh, the north neighbor are not part of the uh, River Commission, International River, okay. River Commission or IMRC. So you talk under So, uh, so uh, of, of course, uh, uh, they, they, they would do because uh, they are not part, part of, of the, uh, the rule that okay. we set among cool. the uh, riparian countries. I want to continue this, but we are going towards the end. <laughs> yes. And I want to paint for everyone, including you, you can put that within this round. How do you see the identity of ASEAN in the future? Mm. What would be the ideal identity for you? So because I've started here, now I'm giving back the opportunity for the representative of the government. Uh, you know, ASEAN is, uh, ASEAN objective is to uh, be based on three pillars, right? So I would name is in a, in a very sh two words, it's advanced civilizations that uh, encompasses uh, uh, economic development, which would benefit all people of ASEAN. On top of that, of course, uh, uh, 
social and cultural developments. Here we are talking about well, not only economic de development, but we are talking about cultural, social diversity mm -hmm. among ASEAN countries. The most diverse uh, 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 culture in the world, I would say. So that would, 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 would be an identity that I would see the ultimate objective or ultimate goal of ASEAN. When do you see that happening? I cannot answer the, your these questions. 2025? No. <laughs> that's just depend, a guess. Just that, that's, that depends on, on all of us. Okay. Uh, sitting here sooner and then rather later. than later or later sooner than sooner later. Than, uh, sooner later sooner better than, 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 than later. Paulo, I bought you five minutes to think okay, okay. on that question if, if I can just sum up because uh, you talk about the fourth industrial revolution yes. uh, please bear in mind that such a revolution is not just mutually exclusive mm. it includes the first second and the third mm. although the emphasis and all that so you must bear in mind not, not every ASEAN country has people who are able to cope with the fourth. Okay. Mm. Okay. So, so the issue is there must be a proper division of labor, uh, and and in that sense, I believe the role of ASEAN can play a greater role by bringing industries that are more labor intensive to the states that needs that. Mm. And of course, uh, Singapore has helped us. We should help the other states mm. as as well. All right. So if not, if we don't do that, uh, we're going to find that where we have different economic growth, mm. disparity of differences become great. Mm. Then ASEAN will have to deal with the migrant problem, mm. you know, going to migrant problem, you see. So Singapore, Malaysia, we can't grow independently of the others. Mm. So I would say one of the single most important value I would like to see in ASEAN mm. is that we believe in prosper thy neighbor. Okay. All right? It's prosper in the sense that uh, we must walk the talk, we must be able to help them with management, improving their capacity, uh, build infrastructure for them if it's necessary, uh, get finances for them if it's necessary, uh, uh, share with them best practices if it's necessary. Main thing is the values that we have is we prosper thy neighbor. Okay. So with that, it doesn't matter to me whether Cha Kui Tiao is in mm. Singapore or with us, okay. if he prospers Singapore, why not? I actually right? ordered Cha Kui Tiao for room service last yeah. night. Yeah. So from I here mean, for, in for, for those who are foreign, you may not know what Cha Kui Tiao is. It's, we'll show it's, you afterwards. It's, 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 it's sort of a noodle dish, uh, which we believe comes from Malaysia anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I ordered from here. <laughs> Miti is here, so I'm not worried. So they can treat everyone. Uh, Dato, before I let you go on that, Thing that you have said, do you see the role of the government being more or less for that to happen? I, more honest, mm. I, I, I think underlying all this, uh, we need to have strong institution, we need to uphold integrity and governance. Okay. Mm. Uh, you see all over the world, failed state, yep. strife, civil war that you're seeing now. Uh, politically, people do not want to mention People say it's political oppression and so many other things. But basically, underlying it, it's an issue of governance. Okay. Right? So I just hope that uh, in the 2025 plan, okay. uh, for the first time, apart from issue of human rights and other things, they have a two paragraph of having an integrity dialogue and okay. emphasis placed on good governance and integrity. So the new identity of ASEAN will have integrity assumed yeah, across. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and I believe that one of the shared value I think people should develop to have a high degree of intolerance mm. okay. for poor governance okay. and corruption. So that's the way you answer big or small, interpret it yourself. Mm. Yeah. I don't have time, I have to move here. No, um, give me the yeah. last word. Let the lady yeah, have I'm the last word. So that's why I have so to give, give that three other first. two first. You see, Singaporeans, they would dictate me. <laughs> Please, that was free. Well, obviously, Chakwetia is, is going to be up for grabs. We're going to have to decide whether you know, it's Malaysian or Singaporean. But um, ASEAN is, can only work when we come together because any single one of us cannot, even talking about uh, whether it's the Mekong, Irrawaddy, or Chao Praia, we cannot talk to the neighbors to the north or the neighbors to the east. You know, they may not be the world's greatest democracy, but they're the biggest. So we will, however, need to talk to them with some weight 
if Malaysia by itself goes and talks to them, it's 25, 30 million people, they're, they're not even going to pay attention. 630 million people with one of the fastest growing regions in the world, now then we will have an international platform. We will be able to go and be listened to, be it, you know, fishing rights or be it islands or be it, you know, river. However, you know, having said this, the water problems and water issues of tomorrow will be very different because disruption is happening as we speak. And that too will change the demographics of what, it, what is going to take place. ASEAN, however, needs to recognize that if we do not actually start to talk to each other and work as a family, because we have been a family for the longest time. We have existed. We are more alike than not alike. You know, you know, be it from Burma all the way across to Vietnam, Laos, Bali, you know, greeting and talking and smiling. And we have so many similarities. It's amazing. We just need to put the dots together. We are a lot closer to each other through Rojak or Chakwetia than we are through pizza. Mm. So we need to recognize that and we need to basically, you know, come together as one in every world forum. We may have our differences within ASEAN, mm. within ourselves, within our family. And like every family, if we squabble, we need to get back together again. But to the outside world, we need to be one, one voice. And then we will have some credence with the world and we will be able to operate. The millennials are not going to give us another chance. Mm. Yeah. Salim. Thank you. Well said. Thank you. Nice meeting. I think that you know the, the there was a lot of wisdom in the concept of unity and diversity. The Panchashila, you know, and, and India had very yes. close links with this idea because we are also a very diverse country. But the only way you're going to get unity is by respecting diversity. Mm. And respecting diversity is a fundamental human rights principle of non-discrimination. And you know we talked about economic growth and political stability. The reality in ASEAN is that there is massive and growing inequality. So, you know, some people are winning and a lot of people are losing. And if you don't come to terms with that, mm. I think the, the ASEAN concept is going to be at risk. But I have a lot of faith in people. People okay. are always ahead of governments. Mm -hmm. So they are going to come together and they're going to fight this battle. And if governments don't respond, they will force them to respond. That's okay. the reality. Thank you very much. I think you're all wonderful. One minute, so, 45 seconds. Five Cs. Continue in this vision, please. Continuity in the vision, in that mission. Next C, consistency in standards and institutions. Third C, please have a caring community. Fourth C, we are all connected. The fourth industrial revolution is making it happen. Fifth C, collaboration. There is so much collaboration opportunities. Outside looking in, just love ASEAN. 600 million population. So much we could do together. Thank you. There you go. I have just uh, one or two more minutes. Questions from the floor? As usual, please raise your hand. The mic will go to you. And please introduce yourself. Young people, if there's no one else, I'm going to point to you. <laughs> you are the millennials. Rebecca? Oh, they love so yes, please. Can we get the mic here? To my left, at the back. So, uh, take on the point Shetty was saying about uh, disparity of uh, distribution of wealth. Uh, right now, you will see that uh, as we go forward, the base of the pyramid, which is uh, the poor poverty marketplace, actually become very sexy because the top of the pyramid is uh, uh, getting very uh, slow in growth and consumption is very slow. So the, the way to get uh, um, social justice is through the marketplace. Mm. And yet, all the time we're talking about fighting, fighting government, um, donating money to distort marketplace because every time we donate, we create a market price of zero mm. and no entrepreneur can start jobs and then they cannot uh, get out of poverty themselves. The Singapore model of turning third world to first world did not rely on charity, but rely on unleashing the spirit of enterprise of the people and their good work ethics. So we could use this as a unifying factor because all the ASEAN countries want to get out of poverty. 
And instead of fighting our government, we should use the marketplace to develop local entrepreneurship, jobs, and all the solution has already been found somewhere around the world. Okay. In energy, in food, in agriculture, in uh, sanitation, water, uh, education, everything. So what we need to do is to work together to solve this type of problem. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very sure that will be a unifying factor for us. Yeah. So that's a comment that yeah, you want us to comment. concentrate more on the marketplace, right? I, I, I would like to uh, hear uh, what are your comments about using marketplace the more. Uh, base of the pyramid uh, solution as the unifying factor for us. Exactly. Yeah. It is the only way to go. Ultimately, I think the ultimate human right is uh, the right for us to be able to eke out a living, you know, and uh, the bottom of the pyramid is where the people have the strongest and most powerful pull. If ASEAN ever gets together, it will be because of the bottom of the pyramid. Thank you. Okay. I, 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 I completely agree because uh, the success of ASEAN is going to be measured by the largeness of the middle class that we create. Okay. And we know with every economic development, there is always the differences in urbanization and rural. So I, I would say that the one word that we, we should put in place is the empowerment of the people, uh, especially in terms of giving them, uh, all of them, uh, education, uh, all of them to upgrade their skills and to readjust and retraining, mm -hmm. and of course, all of them to have the opportunity for employment. Yeah. Just to be the typical devil's advocate, easy to say that here, but infrastructure, resources, and money has to be used to get that. There are deep pockets of the jungles of Malaysia where the schools, their floors are still the ground. It's not cement. And in Laos, if I go there, it will be more than that. So would you like to give your part to that proposition of an idea? Well, an idea, of course, equality. Equality has come, come as, as, as a must in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, income distribution. I agree uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, what we have said here that uh, there is a big gap now between the rich and the poor. But this, this is something that we need to urgently address uh, if ASEAN really uh, is to be a, a unity, a unified ASEAN. Any but, last? Farin, can yeah, I say, go ahead. Uh, again, you know, I just want to go back to the same point that we say yes, there's a gap between rich and the poor, but we have to understand that the inequality, economic inequality, is related to the inequality in terms of voice and freedoms. They're not two different things. Because okay. those who don't have a voice are the ones who are poor. And so they won't be seen if there's yeah. no voice. And so you, know, you cannot say, let's have a fourth industrial revolution. That's mm. really cool and sexy. We'll mm -hmm. all talk to each other. Mm -hmm. But these people, the younger people are talking to each other. They're not just talking about the marketplace. They're also saying, what about our government? You know, they're not accountable. Do mm -hmm. we have a voice? When they start raising that, if you're a blogger in Vietnam, you're going to be arrested. So you can't separate these things, you know. You can't say let's cut out economic inequality. But and they can also go the inequality. other way around. It's like a knife with two sides. Mm -hmm. You can use that to voice. You can use that to unravel. It's a package. You opened it. You opened it. So that's why you must speak together, especially the young voices. I'm going to let you have the last say on this. So it is amazing because generally, I think many corporates are actually powerful. We had a session earlier about corporate social innovation and they are engaging the enterprises. So the young people today want that voice to be heard as well. So collaboration is key. We actually have a big company and they've set up something called the Silent Foundation. They want to give the voice to the unheard, the voices that are not heard. Mm -hmm. So I think corporates is a way in which we could channel some of this collaboration in which we could meet the bottom of the pyramid. You want to add? The only thing that I would like to add is we need our way forward is to create entrepreneurship as a way of thinking, mm. whether it's in the school systems or otherwise. If you have school leavers coming out of, say, India as opposed to China, the difference is the Indians are looking for jobs, whereas the Chinese are out there to create jobs. Now, here in ASEAN, we need to be able to develop that kind of entrepreneurship. Then we are at the bottom of the pyramid building upwards. And I wish we can innovate time. So many things we can do with more time, but that's all the time that we have. So the key takeaways for me here is this is a journey. It has not ended. There are many grey areas, not just black and white to see things. 
you have to look at the local context, you have to respect the universality of things. There's no clear answer yet, but the hope lies in the millennials. The governments are trying, but maybe the young ones can give solutions better and faster. That's all the time we have. Thank you so much to the World Economic Forum for partnering Astro Awani and making this possible for us to beam this across to all audience, not just here, but out there, which is the grassroots, and you are important. I will end with the story of that kid. That kid was walking in the heart of Borneo at the highland 1,000 meters above sea level, right there smack in the jungle where two countries, Malaysia and Indonesia, the borders doesn't exist, but they live as one community. So his term of history is already there. We know we are diverse, but we are not adverse. Yes, forced revolution or otherwise, but we will not reverse. For because we know in our values we will always be prosperous. Thank you and goodbye. See you next time. <laughs>